The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Nanoush Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. On today's show, I have Beck Muslimov and Nikolai Tretyakov, who are co-founding partners of Leafy Tunnel. Leafy Tunnel is an early stage venture capital firm investing in alternative medicine to address mental health and pain disorders. Beck, Nikolai, how are you? Welcome. Hi, Anush. Hi, Anush. All good, thanks. Thanks for having us. No, real pleasure. We've obviously been trying to get this on for a while, so I'm really excited to chat to you guys. Loads of stuff to talk about, as always, things going on. But why don't we kick off where we usually start and get a bit of information about both of you on a kind of personal level. What were you doing before and how and why did you get into cannabis? Yeah, I'll start uh, with me. So uh, my name is Beck. I was born and raised in Kazakhstan. In my childhood, especially after the collapse of Soviet Union, I saw how many families... And my family was an exception, struggled financially, lost their jobs. It was a huge, such a huge drain on mental health of people. And people, including my family member, were resorting to alcohol to cope with anxiety, stress, depression, and pain. And my mother, from early on, seeded the idea in my head that alcohol is evil and has enormous capacity to destroy people's lives. As I reflect back, it was a valuable insight that shaped my life and became one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing with uh, Leafy Tunnel. There is a big dissonance between actual and perceived risk of legal and illegal substances, serious side effects of cannabis and psychedelics are extremely rare, while alcohol and tobacco contribute to 10 million deaths a year. So career-wise, I started my career at Deloitte, moved to London 14 years ago to work in corporate m a for a large publicly listed FTSE 100 company responsible, was responsible for acquisitions. We bought companies with overall value of over 5 billion. And then I joined forces with Nikolai eight years ago to, to run investment firm Luaya. We were investing in early stage tech companies. It was a bit of transition. I used to invest 100 millions in mature large companies and at Blue Wire, we were investing hundred thousands in early stage startups. So it was a steep learning curve. We were able to understand what it takes to build a billion dollar company and what is the right foundation for this type company should be. Over time, Nikolai and I refined our skills in, in early stage investments and we were able to spot early companies such as Monza, Deliveroo, where we invested in the early rounds. So how I ended up in the cannabis space, we invested in a U.S. cannabis company early on whilst we were ramping up our tech portfolio. And I remember the time when I was bringing up in our conversation with investors, our investments in a U.S. cannabis company, it certainly raised eyebrows and people were thinking at that time that we were crazy. Here we now, and we believe that cannabis and psychedelics are class of alternative medicine, which would potentially address mental health and pain disorders. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I think I also chip in, so I think Beck has all, almost covered everything. <laughs> but obviously, <laughs> yeah, I started, so I also was born in Kazakhstan, but raised in Russia, and I started my career at Deloitte as well in consulting and worked as an investment bank. And I finished my kind of corporate career in 2013 at one of the largest energy utility companies. I was running M&A deals. And then in 2013 slash 14, I and Beck, we started an investment company, which is called Blue Wire Capital. And I think over the time, as of today, I can say that we developed and executed our previous investment strategy really well. And time has come just to move on and embark on a new journey with Leafy Tunnel. Yeah. So what led me to the cannabis industry is obviously our I think curiosity and also our previous investments that we made quite early in 2012. And since then, we've been following the markets and it's been a phenomenal journey. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty going on all the time, isn't there? I mean, I always quite like this story. You know, one of the themes of the kind of podcast is a bit around career change. Yeah. And, you know, you guys both came from, you know, very kind of very corporate and big company backgrounds. How have you found the kind of more choppy waters of early stage businesses in general? 
Yeah, it's a good one. At the beginning, it'll be challenging because obviously when you start doing new thing, you are very kind of strapped with your resources and also in the network as well. So nobody knows you and then you have to really start everything from the scratch. And, but it, you know, over time, you just start building it. And, you know, as long as you have your mission and, and your goals and ambitions. So I think it's, you know, the sky is the limit. And I think we've proven that over the last oh, seven years that we could do some interesting things together. And, you know, having four unicorns under the belt, I think it shows something that we've been good at spotting big winners and, you know, we've spotted them quite early. Yeah. That must be great confidence as well, because I guess early stage investments, very uncertain. There's a thousand things that could go wrong. And I always ask the question as well, again, particularly coming from the backgrounds that you did, did you encounter any sort of stigma when you started being a bit more kind of open and focused on this sector or these sectors rather? I think a little bit, yeah, you know, from the outset and the very beginning, yes. So, but not maybe stigma, but just in general, people didn't understand what we were going after and you know 2012 in the US uh, cannabis space it was a bit tricky but then obviously <laughs> seven eight years later so it became evident for everyone so that that was the right bet on the company and that company actually we invested really early stage and it's been through many ups and downs since then but the management was so brilliant so they could manage uh, to pivot from a, a medicinal play to kind of recreational play because in then in 20, I think 14, 15, it was quite clear that the whole market just, you know, kind of took the view and went for, went down the recreational route and the company had to pivot and kind of adopted the new strategy and executed well. Yeah. And this, and we will come on to this actually in sort of the second half, the kind of things that contribute to success in a startup. But then maybe we can talk a bit about Leafy Tunnel itself now. And so maybe you could sort of tell us a bit about what you guys do at Levy Tunnel, what's your investment thesis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anush, as you mentioned, so Levy Tunnel is an early stage venture capital firm investing in alternative medicine to address mental health and pain disorders. So we believe that these two disorders are the biggest healthcare challenges nowadays with 2 billion sufferers worldwide. So we are currently primarily focused on the European market. We are concentrating on building a portfolio of companies that will eventually lead legitimize and form the future of cannabis and psychedelics in the medical industry. As to our investment horizon, we've, because we are an early stage firm and we always invest long term at seeds and series A stages. So the time to exit would be, you know, from entering an investment is from five to eight years. That's a nutshell. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so a bit more long term than some investors in the space. Yeah. 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 What's your sort of thesis, I guess, around what you're looking for and what's good and what's, what doesn't fit for you guys? Yeah, so there are a few areas that we really wouldn't touch. So we did not invest in any recreational part of the market, so, but only medicinal one and mostly pharmaceutical. So we believe that some market segments over time will become very commoditized as well. For example, cultivation for cannabis, where the only differentiation would be either price or quality. So generally speaking, we invest in downstream companies, I would say. Cool, cool. And actually, just while I've got you, <laughs> things that I'm learning about sort of VC investing, how important is it to, you know, you make your first investment in a company, but how important is it to be able to support them throughout further life cycles and be able to follow on investing further rounds? Yeah, it is important. So as any early station last month, so, you know, it's quite an early journey. So you have to be really supportive of the company and uh, it requires a lot of resources as well, but mostly time. So we dedicate time and our commitment to those companies. So trying to help them with various tasks. So we, you know, very supportive with our network and because we have, we have, you know, great previous experience of working at a, you know, big four companies. So we know how this process has uh, been set up, either budgeting or financial planning or, you know, various metrics that we like to trace. So yeah, that's in a nutshell, a lot of support actually, and a lot of activities that takes place with uh, early stage companies. Yeah. And how receptive are companies to that, you know, in terms of, I mean, I guess for a lot of them, priority is to get some money in the door. How receptive are they to the, the extra help that you can give? It's a good one, actually. Yeah. So, you know, we're not trying to impose our vision because obviously we as venture 
uh, investors we should share the vision of the company we invest in. So in this case, I would say that we don't really interfere with the, you know, with its operations, its kind of vision, strategy, etc. But we are just trying to be supportive to a little bit adjust things if they go not in the right direction or if we, you know, think that the support is really needed. But trying to stay, you know, close to the company, but not to interfere with anything. Yeah. You don't want to suffocate them. Yeah, <laughs> well, and, and I guess, you know, part of your job up front is to, to find those entrepreneurs and management teams that you think, you know, are strong on their own merits and maybe just offer them some guidance if they need it. Yeah, that, that, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, definitely just ability to learn. I think that's important. You, as a founder, especially if you're operating frontier markets, markets that's still developing and developing its own customer base. There will be lots of things that will be fluid and changing. So founders should, should be quickly be able to adapt to a changing environment and also learn and be receptive to feedback. Yeah. Sorry to go on a slight tangent, but I find this aspect, the human element, very, very interesting. Have you kind of developed some good questions and some ways that you get a feel for people's attitude towards change? Because I would imagine it's essential for any entrepreneur to be, you know, have the ability to to cope with a very changing kind of landscape. Yeah, indeed, that's true. So we have our our own proprietary kind of framework, how we assess companies, and we really pay attention to the mindset of the people we are investing in. So, and this, it's, it, you know, takes time to kind of comprehend things in a different manner and just to, you know, think big, but also, you know, with limited resources at the same time. Yeah, so that, that's, I think, in January. Cool, cool. In, in terms of Leafy Tunnel, it's, how do you, I mean, there's a few other VC funds that, that are out there, obviously several big ones in the US, and there's, there's a few on this side of the pond too. How do you feel that you're sort of differentiating from the other guys? Yeah, I would say we, we have three key differentiators. So first of all, we are you know trying to shoot for the stars. So by saying that, we aim to invest in companies that can deliver at least a 10x return. So therefore, we tend to invest, you know, we do not tend to invest in linear businesses in various linear business models as, you know, cultivation for cannabis, for example, or clinics or retreats for psychedelics. Secondly, I think our investment is centered around novel and alternative medicine. And we are looking at both markets, cannabis and psychedelics simultaneously. So because we believe that the European cannabis market is already established one, though a relatively small, but fast growing. But as to psychedelics, we are very optimistic about the market, though it's still in its infancy. And we can, you know, we call it here as an alpha market. In this market, we tend to make a bet on companies that are after creating platforms to invent and test novel compounds. So these types of companies are typically, you know, better funded and have an advantage over other smaller rivals. And uh, last but not least, we are looking at these markets very holistically and we are in constant dialogue with academia and non-profit foundations that have been advancing psychedelic science for years. So there is no innovation without research and no progress without innovation. I think therefore, you know, fundamental research is of utmost importance. We obviously acknowledge that and help support the industry at its core. Fantastic. Great. And then just, uh, you know, one last bit on Leafy Tunnel. If you have to just choose one thing, what's the kind of main thing that you've learned since starting it? Because that's our first fund, actually, and it's a regulated fund, which we run. It requires, I think, better uh, diligence and attention to detail and compliance. And we've started relying on broader investment base, and it also has its own pros and cons. So investment in biotech and life science companies also require strong expertise and we engage top caliber professionals with a strong scientific capability, you know, in life science and drug development. And over the last years, we managed just to build strong relationship with key industry uh, thought leaders in the cannabis and, and psychedelic space. But though I think in general, the principles to invest in have not change that much we have our own proprietary framework of assessing the companies and it has worked so far very well great great so always have a good expert in the background but sounds like you've done a lot of hard work before starting anyway so that's good 
Cool. Well, look, the kind of main area we're going to talk about today is sort of the general rise in investor interest in, in cannabis and psychedelics and a bit of a kind of deep dive on institutional capital. So I always like to take it, you know, very kind of 101 and high level to begin with. What are the typically the sort of different types of investors and different types of startup involved in this space and how do they kind of match up? Sure. Yeah. So maybe I'll start with companies. So there could be private companies, could be public companies, obviously public companies, it's much, much more established companies with a long history of operations. Now our speciality invests in early stage private companies. An early stage company could have a team developing a product. They may have first customers, some ideas on the product market fit. And this company would normally raise a seed financing. The company which already have developed the product and, and have revenue and recurring customer base, they would consider raising capital to scale their business and dominate a particular market or country. This company will raise Series A and then company raising growth stage, they would go and use this capital and deploy this capital to dominate and expand into other geographies and markets. So uh, with respect to Leafy Tunnel, we focus on investing in seed and series A stages. So that, that's our sweet spot. If we invest in seed stage, we will normally focus in our due diligence on founders and the team and we'll invest primarily on the vision of the founder. In a series A, when the company will use capital to scale, we'll be focusing on, on the execution capabilities of the team. The company should have by then have a product market fit. On the investor side, there are different type of investors. It could be family offices, funds, angel investors, or retail investors. Family offices can invest in both private or public markets, venture funds or private equity funds generally invest in private markets. So retail investors invest mainly in public markets. And there are also institutional type of investors. Institutional investors, if we just delve into definition of that, is a company or an organization that invests money on behalf of clients normally employs professional investment team, which retains autonomy in making decisions. Type of institutional investors will include investment funds, endowments, asset management firms. The family office can also be institutional investor, especially if in-house investment team acts with certain degree of discretion when making decision to invest or not. Brilliant. Okay, cool. Thank you. And, you know, not all money is equal. <laughs> what do you think? And I guess, you know, when you're raising money and if you've never done it before, you probably just want to get anything you can in the door. But sometimes that's not always the best tactic. If you're a startup, what type of investor do you want on board? If you're a startup, obviously you want, as Nicola already mentioned, you want a aligned long-term investor, right? Who will be at all the stages of the company evolution there to support and the role, for example, of institutional investor, where, for example, Leafy Tunnel could be considered as institutional type investor. We manage funds on behalf of our limited partners, investors. And there are three, I guess, benefits of having institutional type investors, Leafy Tunnel, in the cap table startup. One is that we long-term oriented. So Nikolai already mentioned that we invest with the horizon from five to eight years. And we believe it takes a time to build a truly transformative company. And we did that with Monza, where we invested in 2015. And it's six years forward, the company is still not public, but they are one of the leaders in the UK banking sector. We also invested in Deliveroo. They, they just did the IPO, but it took them seven years to get to that. So with cannabis and psychedelics, we also, we're shooting for the stars and it takes time to build those stars. And with institutional type investors, we, we long-term oriented. As soon as we develop investment mandate, it's rare cases where we deviate from this investment mandate. Institutional type of investors bring structured due diligence, uh, so they're quite selective when they invest in companies, so companies that are backed by institutional type of investors, normally of high quality, and also institutional type of investors, they can bring larger resources and pool of capital to scale the company. So, yeah, for startup... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really interesting because, I mean, in my mind, I'd always assumed institutional capital was banks and pension funds. But it's interesting that, you know, people that don't fit that mold could also kind of fit under the banner of institutional capital. It seems to be, you know, a bit of a time horizon perspective as well, that you're basically, it's a bit more patient capital. Is that kind of fair enough to say? Yeah, yeah, correct. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So, 
you know, if we're drilling down, especially on institutional capital, how are you seeing that interacting with cannabis and psychedelics? And let's sort of work on the assumption that both are early, but psychedelics is really early. Yeah. Well, I'll probably draw on the examples of our prior investments. So when we invested in US cannabis company back in 2012, the type of investors that we were meeting, who were considering to co-invest with us, they were largely family offices and there was no focus on venture private equity funds. Now, eight years forward, there are at least dozens and dozens of venture private equity funds focusing on cannabis with wide base of institutional type of investors. So market in the US evolved considerably with institutional investors entering this space. US cannabis, for example, back then was less than two billion and it was largely medical. So in a way, Europe reminds us where US was eight years ago when we made our first investment in US cannabis company. So it's exciting time to invest in European cannabis companies. We are seeing fairly benign competition for deals and good companies as there are not many venture private equity funds operating in this space. Uh, we also one of the early investors in Atai Life Sciences, which is the largest company by market capitalization in psychedelic space. It's a biotech platform focused on mental health. The, the main subsidiary is the Compass Pathways, which is running a phase two clinical trials for, for psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. We invested in early financing rounds of this company, primarily with the family offices and non, all non institutional type of investors. And the last, last financing round before IPO, which was two years after we invested, we saw that leading biotech funds and venture capital arms of large pharmaceutical companies also participated in the last crossover pre-IPO round. Again, we see that psychedelics market is also maturing with the entrance of institutional investors, which is a good sign for both in cannabis and psychedelics markets. Yeah, that's a really interesting point as well, I think. How would you kind of differentiate, or not even differentiate necessarily, it's quite obvious, but how are you seeing the interaction between cannabis-specific funds and sort of adjacent sector funds like biotech or life science funds? Yeah, so on the cannabis focus for founders, when they're attracting capital, they not only attracting, I guess, resources to, to scale the company, but also the attracting the expertise. So working with the cannabis focused funds or psychedelic focused funds certainly will help founder to be able to draw on their knowledge and expertise as well as explore potential synergies with their portfolio companies, which we actually doing right now. Uh, so we recently closed investment in Denmark, where we invested in a medical cannabis company, and we're already exploring various potential synergies uh, with our own portfolio companies. Yeah. And I can imagine if you're dealing with a life sciences fund, perhaps as the entrepreneur, there's more of a journey to sort of educate them on the specific sector as well. So for the founder, if they dealing with the generalist biotech founder, yes, of course. So they, they need to, yeah, it will take time for the founder to indicate the, this type of investor. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, cool. And then, so what are the sort of key challenges, do you think, for institutional investors looking at the cannabis and psychedelic space? So I think there are not that many, actually, for psychedelics, but though there is still capital, and you know, coming from retail, because there are a few companies already public. But also, I think, to my mind, currently, I'm seeing that even for psychedelics, there are maybe a lot of capital in comparison with the, you know, European cannabis market, for example. And there are some reasons for that. And some psychedelics, you know, are way less uh, kind of stigmatized. For instance, psilocybin, which is, you know, has far less negative media publicity and cultural baggage than LSD. So that's investments not coming from only retail investors, but also from big pharma. For instance, uh, Japanese pharma, Atsuka, you know, quite likes this sector and has made a few bets already. Unfortunately, we don't see this in the European cannabis space. But obviously, quite recently been a, I would say, a land, landmark deal when Curaleaf has bought Emark for 300 million, which was really kind of a, a signature deal for the industry. But other than that, it's still relatively small in its infancy, but because it's too early and that, you know, we as Leafy Tunnel and such funds are really needed to support this ecosystem in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it is early, isn't it? With that in mind, you know, how are you viewing sort of the public markets? There's quite a few people who are kind of going to the public markets 
quite early, you know, possibly don't have a huge amount of revenue if some don't have any. How do you kind of see that? I think that'll be different because psychedelics companies, they tend to kind of become public way faster because they need a lot of capital to run their clinical trials. Unlike cannabis companies, especially if we you know, talking about the US cannabis market when it's still kind of mostly recreational. And there is a, you know, private capital, which is going into this industry and also public. But uh, in general, I think it's still, it's, no, it's still small numbers. And I think we just really kind of started the whole industry. And the Europeans literally just tiny. It's very tiny in comparison with the US. And US, I think last year, the sales was around $17 billion. And this year, it will double that number as well. So it's kind of getting there, but it's, it's still recreational, which is we're not really looking at. And we believe in the kind of medicinal angle of cannabis and psychedelics. And I think that that's where the you know, value appreciation would happen. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be quite different. Well, certainly in relation to cannabis, I think it will be quite different on this side of the pond Indeed, yeah. versus the US. And so how would you assess the kind of current availability of capital in general for cannabis and psychedelics companies? Yeah, we see a slight exuberance on capital markets for psychedelics and also rush of capital from speculative investors, sort of not long-term oriented investors like us, for example. So what this means for Lufitana, we increase in our rigor in our due diligence and evaluation of companies. We becoming very selective when we invest in now in this space, as we know that market corrections are an inevitable part of the evolution of the market. So we're sort of trying to be a little bit more cautious when we do due diligence. On the European cannabis space, we see a big capital crunch, especially for early stage companies. The availability of capital for late stage European cannabis companies somewhat better, as investors can be attracted by short path to liquidity for IPO. The good thing though is that at Leafy Tunnel, because we're focusing on Series A stage, we're able to enter cannabis company at fairly low valuations, creating opportunity for our investors in our fund to achieve meaningful investment returns. Yeah. And do you think a bit of that is people being burnt before? You know, it's all very exciting cannabis. Lots of people rushing in and, and realizing that there's so much infrastructure that hasn't been built yet. Do you think that sort of led to a bit more caution and why people are waiting for companies to be at a slightly further level of maturity before? Yeah, kind of. We still call it frontier markets. And as any frontier market, psychedelics are going through kind of, you know, different stages of comprehension and adoption. So the same type of logic would have been applied to the ask cannabis markets and crypto, for example. So both markets have gone through the cycles of kind of hype and price inflation, though it's now obvious that both markets are here to stay. In my opinion, psychedelics, you know, is not an exception and it will stay here for a long time. Yeah, no, no. I mean, absolutely. There's a lot of excitement and a, a kind of nice way to round it up. Do you feel like, I mean, you alluded to it just before. Do you think the psychedelic space is sort of repeating some of the same mistakes of the cannabis industry in relation to sort of the exuberance, etc.? You're probably, Anush, you're probably referring to significant market correction that happened in two years ago when lots of public cannabis companies lost their market capitalization value, right? Yeah. Well, that, yeah. that had to do more with the mismanagement and governance of companies, but also that significant source of capital was coming from speculative investors. Psychedelics are different to cannabis in a way that the most valuable companies in this space are life science and drug development companies. Whereas we, in a cannabis space, it's mostly operating in, in the medical and recreational market. So psychedelics, it's a largely biotech play. And with the nature of biotech companies, it all comes down where the company will be successful in the clinical trials. So for example, psychedelics proving efficacious for treatment of mental health disorders and for psychiatry and historical overall success rate for drug development in psychiatry was one of the lowest amongst all other healthcare categories. So meaning that some companies will be successful in the trials, but majority will, will be not. Meaning that those companies that are listed and then they raise public money to fund the trials, they will lose value if they won't get the regulatory approvals. There are also speculative investors in psychedelic space, which have fairly short investment horizon. And when the market correction happens, they will be forced to leave. And obviously, sort of leaving this space 
dried up of creating the shortage of capital for companies operating in the space. Leafy tunnel are not in this game, is not in this game. And what's good, we see an emergence of other similar type of investors like us, more long-term oriented. And that would provide continuity for capital markets. And also, yeah, so that, that would allow young private companies to weather any storms that potentially can happen mm-hmm. in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I mean, I would sort of interpret that as, you know, I would say psychedelics feels very speculative on that basis because, as you said, it's sort of biotech play and the odds, as you described, are stacked against most companies in terms of the outcome of the trials that they're undertaking. So unless you really know what you're doing, and even then you probably only know a certain amount, is a bit of a punt, right? It is, yeah. You're absolutely right, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sitting on the edge of <laughs> on whether to put some money in myself. Cool. Well, look, guys, this is really super interesting. I love learning more about this stuff and hearing how you guys are doing as well is great as well. So thank you for coming on. And it'd be great to have you back on at some point to sort of see how some of your investments are going. Yeah, the pleasure is all ours, yeah. Cool. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Anish. Thank you, Anish. Nice. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.